course over the last year and a half, and I, I felt I was getting sort of in a rut. I kept making the same, you know, uh, uh, with my best wishes, peace and freedom, and I thought I'd have to think of something else to say sometimes. And uh, so someone suggested to me, uh, one of the places where I was doing signing, that it's never too late to get on the bus. It's never too late to get on the bus. Uh, I'll try to explain that maybe in a moment, but uh, I think there are perhaps obvious connections between what the Freedom Riders did back in 1961, 50 years ago. We just went through an amazing 50th anniversary. Some of you may have seen, of course, the, the film, which I, I hope as many of you as possible will get a chance to see next Wednesday if you haven't already seen it. Actually, they're going to have it kick off the new uh, PBS uh, season, I think, on January 27th, so it'll be on, uh, I think, both WUSF and WEDU. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's Stanley Nelson is a remarkable filmmaker. I worked with him for three years to try to uh, turn a book into a, a film, and uh, he's just a magician, really. And uh, I think it was very, very deserving of the three Emmys that won back in September. And, and uh, of course, it, it, uh, it, uh, we, uh, Oprah Winfrey saw it, as some of you may know, and uh, called Stanley five minutes later in tears, saying, I've got to get you and the Freedom Riders on one of my last shows. And she actually did it, flew in 180 of them in, in Chicago. And it was a remarkable moment to see some of the Freedom Riders who hadn't seen each other for 50 years. In some cases, they had communicated. Uh, without seeing each other in Parchment Prison. And uh, we're actually meeting each other for the first time. It was one of the most emotional things I've ever seen. But everything about the Freedom Rides is emotional. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's not too strong a statement to say that uh, probably many of us would not be in this room together today if it weren't for people like Bernard Lafayette and the other Freedom Riders. Those 436 audacious, outrageous, unreasonable troublemakers uh, who uh, decided to confront the Jim Crow system frontally without regard to their own uh, physical situation, uh, without regard to all the advice they were getting, mostly from their elders saying, this is the craziest thing you've ever done, you're going to ruin your life if you, if you do this if you dare the white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan to stop you from exercising your constitutional rights. Uh, and, but, but somehow they dredged up the wisdom and the courage, many of them only 18, 19. Uh, Bernard was 20 years old when he became a freedom rider. In fact, he didn't get permission from his parents. He grew up in New York City. And, and uh, uh, when he sent them the, the consent form to be on the first freedom ride, uh, uh, he didn't get any response, and he uh, finally called up his parents, and uh, his mother said, did, did you, did you, thought we, you, you knew we'd read this thing, we know what you're trying to do. We sent you to, up to Nashville uh, to get an education, not to annoy white folks, and we're not going to sign your death warrant. But later, when there were more freedom rights, uh, uh, he became one of the, one of the leaders, and uh, uh, really changed the course of history. Um, I know this is a commemoration for Dr. King, uh, but I think it's important, and I think in the spirit of Dr. King, he would be, above anyone else, I think, would want us to recognize the, the notion of the civil rights movement as a movement, as a social movement involved, involving hundreds, thousands of people, uh, that uh, he was a leader, certainly, and a charismatic figure, uh, but I think he drew strength from the strength of others in addition to inspiring, and the Freedom Rides is a classic case of that, where he did not initiate the Freedom Rides, he was certainly a supporter, he spoke for them, uh, he raised funds, uh, he, was a, he was an important an important figure, but it was a collective enterprise, and I think that's the, that's the message, really, of the Freedom Rides, that it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's an empowering story, that ordinary people, Truly ordinary people can do extraordinary things with enough courage and conviction and commitment, particularly to the philosophy of nonviolence, um, that uh, even when you're up against extraordinary 
uh, opponents who seem to have all the cards, who have the money, who have the institutional support. I mean, the Freedom Riders had no business thinking they could pull this off, that they could defy a national presidential administration, they could defy public opinion, defy their elders, and to sort of force the nation to reconsider its commitment to democracy. I mean, in, in, in simply winning the right to sit on the front of a bus or to get a cup of coffee or a hamburger or go into a restroom as a, as a human being, um, they, they redefined American citizenship. I mean, if you've ever wondered why the 1960s were so different from the 1950s, the Freedom Rides is not a bad place to start.